I've over and over again seen the incredible cleverness and ingenuity of so many people inside. This is partly a condition of captivity. It's something you do, you, you use your wit to get round uh, the system. And often, obviously, it's turned to rule breaking. And if only this incredible cleverness and ingenuity and creativity that you see in prisons could be turned to pro-social activities, then these places could be schools for entrepreneurs. What you hear about, of course, is the nasty stuff, the weapons made out of toothbrushes, the guns made out of soap, drugs smuggled in in stamps, and I was even once told about someone who was able to hide razor, bl razor blades behind his eyelids. Incredible, but apparently true. And yet, I have seen the most amazing beauty and capacity for creativity in prison. This is really paradoxical. You think of these places, they're totally anti-beauty. Everything about them is impoverished and featureless and aggressive. The barbed wire, the concrete spaces, the bars, the emptiness. All of it is intended to convey hardness and depersonalization. But imagine, imagine if prisons were very different. Imagine if prison dining rooms were full of furniture made in workshops by prisoners. The walls were painted with murals if prisoners had their own soft furnishings in their cells and were encouraged to put their own artwork on the walls. Now, this is not as off the wall and subversive as it may sound, because craft work in prison is actually, honestly, as old as prison itself. People have always done things with their hands in prison. Carpenters in the Napoleonic Wars who were imprisoned made furniture in French prisons, and there's still a tradition of furniture making in French prisons today. Bird boxes, guitars, ornamental ironwork, stone carvings, cane chairs, palm leaf bags, embroidery, silverwork, hammocks, are all made in prisons in America, in Chile, in Portugal, in Bolivia, and in Britain. There's an important point here, which is that people get creative, we all do, in situations of boredom and confinement. It's so basic a human instinct. It's like sailors who did not work in the vastness of the sea on their ships, or nuns in their, in their, in their convent cells embroidering away. The need to express, to express personhood, and to celebrate, and to decorate, and to communicate, and to, to connect, is just something that can't be eradicated even by the harshest prison. And actually, I think it's at the core of our potential, all of our potential, to redeem ourselves from our failings, to connect through creativity. Prisons actually are in many respects more creative than other environments, because, just because of the sensory de deprivation of the environment. When there's little that's pleasing to the ear, the eye, or the soul, we fall back on dreams, and we fall back on fantasy, and we use our imaginations. Over there is an embroidered picture by an ex-prisoner called Ray Matterson, who was in prison for drug offenses and who discovered embroidery in his cell. And guess how he did? He was so bored, he was unraveling a bit of old sock from his foot. And he, and he had a needle, and he started to sew with it. He took off his sock, and he unraveled the sock, and he started to embroider, and he created a picture. And then he created this series of miniature sort of pictures of his life. And that was his route. And he now is an artist whose works sell for thousands and thousands of pounds. And the size of that is just a couple of inches. It's just an, an inch and a half across. And for each inch of Ray's work, there are one and a half thousand stitches. On this side, another object, which is actually, in reality, absolutely tiny. These little roses are made out of ground-up pencil shavings, PVA glue, and um, the ink from felt-tip pens, and they're each uh, less than six millimeters across. And this actually is a prison craft. It's, people do it in a lot of prisons in this country. They mix up their ground pencil shavings and their glue, and they use that, and, and they make miniature sculptures. And there's kind of an interesting point here, which is that the miniaturism is a kind of characteristic of prison. If you think about it, it's a very shrunken world, and miniature things um, don't take up much room in it, but they also reflect it, the narrow perspective, and a kind of obsession with detail, which you can escape into. This is an extraordinary thing. Again, it's blown up very, very big, and it's actually only three inches across. And for each inch of this bit of, of embroidery, there are 28 stitches across. 
and the guy has actually mixed his thread within those stitches to create, uh, can anyone guess what it is? It's the view from his cell window. And there's a, a wonderful line, a famous line from Oscar Wilde about the little patch of blue that the prisoner calls the sky. And this is what this guy saw year, for years. That was his only view. And the attention to detail is quite wonderful. And out of something so sad and so depressing, he's actually made something, I think, fine and poetic. The shape, actually, the hexagonal shape, is the hexagonal hub at the center of, of um, Wandsworth Prison, which is like a bicycle wheel with this hub at the center, which is that, and the prison wings radiating off it like the spokes of a wheel. And this is the cell. This is a cell in HMP Wandsworth. There's a phrase that's um, widely used in prison, behind the door you cry. And, and the truth is, when you're alone in the cell and that door is slammed on you, however much of face um, you put out to the world of, I didn't do it, or braggadocio, or whatever kind of front you're having to present to the world and yourself, when that door slams, you're alone with your thoughts, which usually are ones of gnawing anger, self-hatred, recrimination. So just imagine how the fundamentally horrible experience of being locked in a cell can be transformed if you have something absorbing to do, if you have something that actually takes you out of that environment and into another place. This guy told me, and I don't think he's unusual, honestly, that he'd written 400 songs and sewn three king-size bed quilts while he was inside. So the picture shows the cramped living conditions but at the same time, I love it because there's an oddness to it, because it also, he looks kind of slightly comfortably drowned in this huge quilt that he's sewing with his faithful harmonium by his side. So there's a point here, which is that in prison, there's a chance actually to acquire skills in things you never, ever would have done in your life before, um, just because you're so bored and you're so confined, and you wouldn't, have done, you wouldn't even have tried embroidery unless you had 17 hours a day to kill in your cell. This is a lovely picture because it captures something of the sheer originality and wit of prison art and craft. Just like the extraordinary view from the cell window and the little flowers made out of pencil shavings and the embroidery made out of sock threads. Um, this is a, obviously a ceramic fish and chips. And, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of comic reflection of the fact that prison food is inedible and horrible. And yet, isn't it lovely? And doesn't it bring delight to the heart? This too, it's hilarious. Um, an embroidered fry-up. Um, and again, it's sort of, <laughs> the, the beauty of it is, is the kind of contrast with the sort of greasy meal and this exquisite stitching. Um, so these are just small examples of the kind of, just the originality and creativity um, that people often discover in themselves for the first time when they're inside. Um, this is a... Uh, lovely model of a Harley Davidson made out of, I don't know if anyone can guess what it's made out of. It's made out of old matchsticks. And this is actually um, a, a prison genre, which is um, matchstick art. And it's widely practiced in prisons across the UK. And the kind of, and actually the, the, the woman who sent me this picture, which is from a charity called the Kersler Trust that have a, a big exhibition in London yearly of arts and crafts work done in prison. Um, she told me that, um, I was like, oh, can I have that really nice one of the Harley Davidson done out of matchsticks? And she said, oh, God, which one? We've got hundreds. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, um, and these skills, are, you know, where do they come from? They're passed on how? From prisoner to prisoner. So there's these kind of indigenous kind of craft practices that are native to prisons um, that, that people share. Just like um, the, the roses made out of pencil shavings, I've seen roses made out of bread, uh, prisoners used to make rouge out of book covers in the 1950s when book covers were often read. Um, uh, I've heard of Venetian blinds made out of loo rolls and boot polish. And these Venetian blinds were so nice that they were getting sold to officers at quite a, a pretty penny. Um, I've also heard of toffee puddings made in kettles. Um, so that instinct to make something out of nothing um, is... is it's, it's a kind of recycling instinct. Um, you know, any bit of old refuse could be useful. I once saw a guy with this lovely little lighter, and I was like, How, you know, where did you get that? And he said, I made it. And I said, well, where did you get the wick? And he said, oh, it's a bit of old mop I found on the floor. Um, and and, and the, the, the case of the, um, of, of the lighter was, was made out of matchsticks, and it was very fine. It was varnished. 
Um, and this is a um, kind of lovely piece of Gothic uh, grandfather clock made out of matchsticks. And I've seen gran other grandfather clocks made out of matchsticks. And I think it's quite interesting that there are so many clocks made out of matchsticks in prison. Well, obviously, it's the theme of time. But again, I mean, this is just an exquisite craft tradition, isn't it? As fine as the finest marquetry. So the question really is how to, talent, how to harness all this talent and all this ingenuity. What if the skilled learned in prison could be recycled, reused after release? What if skilled learned could offer not deprivation and despair, but a chance to really change, harnessing creativity and pride in people? The point, of course, is that prisons are places where untold quantities of hours take their toll, and that's what they're meant to. And there is a need to fill this time. So how about filling it with something useful and creative? and something that can be done easily in a cell. In the 19th century, prisoners were put on tread wheels, which did, had served no purpose whatsoever. All they were supposed to do was like walk, just turn this wheel round and round. And to me, that's, um, that's, a, very, that's a really cruel thing to do to someone. It's, a kind of, it's kind of a mockery of them as a person, like setting someone for hours on end to do something utterly meaningless and pointless and valueless devaluing the person themselves. Well, so how about if time spent pointlessly could be transformed into time spent meaningfully? Don't we all crave that? And in our fast-paced digital lives, um, the fashion for not just recycling, it's called upcycling now, isn't it? And slow living. These seem to be rather middle-class kind of pursuits and privileges. Well, imagine if the expanse of prison hours and the time needed for the skill craftsmanship of the old world could be put to use in prison. The 19th century arts and crafts movement was precisely um, against the depersonalizing, devaluing, cheapening effects of industrialization. And in another way, we're here again with that same feeling of uh, a devalued, um, devalued products um, in, in, our, in our world as well. The world of mass marketing and industrialization. Um, so, so a prisoner doing needlework in his cell, for fine cell work, said this. He said, doing the needlework opens up another world. He wrote this to me. Um, There's the pride and usefulness in seeing something of beauty come together, and the thought that me and my friend's work will bring pleasure now and hopefully long into the future to the recipient. It allows us to once again start something new and be useful. And I find this the most incredible, incredibly moving bit of writing. We get them all the time because it just conveys the kind of, um, the sort of redeeming quality um, of, of, of being able to be use, useful in a place where you are so shamed and shunned and devalued. Um, imagine, you know, being uh, viewed not uh, by the crimes you committed, but by the skill of the objects that you make. The liberation then from being ostracized and segregated and the prospect of actually bringing pleasure and beauty into the lives of others. The person at the center of the making and hands that no longer offend, but hands that create. So the main crafts industry in British prisons is embroidery. And it's the only one, paradoxically, which is done on a fairly industrial scale. We now work with more than 300 prisoners at any one time doing embroidery in their cells, about 270 doing embroidery in their cells, and about 50 working on sewing machines in prison workshops. This is the largest uh, professional body of hand stitchers in the West. And believe me, we're turning them down all the time because we simply don't have the capacity to work with as many prisoners um, as want to do something useful, do something creative, do something that can make them some extra money. We simply don't have the capacity to sell all that they could make but the capacity for them to make things and make things wonderfully is there. Uh, the people we work with, uh, and their work is sold, by the way, to interior designers and to museums and internationally. It's become well known and it's sold to members of the royal family. It's really, really good stuff. And these people that we work with work voluntarily in their cells, no one's making them, for 20 to 40 hours a week. So imagine how good they get at embroidery and imagine how good they could get at somewhat, something else just if the time was put to use and the structures were put in place for that to be possible in our prisons. People in prison are, broadly speaking, from incredibly disadvantaged backgrounds. That's actually, that's largely why they're there and why they end up offending. Um, a quarter of people in prison were in care as children. 
And a third experienced abuse as children. A third of people in prison experienced abuse as children. More than two-thirds have mental health disorders, and half of them can't read properly. And these are people that we lock up for 17 hours a day. What the hell use is that? <laughs> what the hell good is it going to do? And interestingly, the vast majority of them, 97% of people in prison, actually express a desire to stop offending. It's just they don't really know how, and their lives are pretty chaotic, and they have all kinds of issues. 70% of them say that having a job is the thing that we most likely, apart from having a home, to make them stop reoffending. These are things we take for granted, having a job and a home. And we calculate that there are 10 times as many people in prison and 10 times as many volunteers wanting to do fine cell work as we have the capacity to manage. So just think about what wonders could be achieved if we could focus all this energy and all this potential for collaboration, because there really is a huge amount of untapped potential in prisons. So just one example of prison creativity to another. These are the industrial quantities of cushions that we make. Um, and always, as I've tried to explain, with the person at the center, in this case, of course, the dog at the center. Um, it's, it's really great for people in prison to sew things with pictures of people's houses and their dogs and commemorative quilts and cushions. It's a connection with other people, a connection with the softer, um, warmer things in life, a connection with love. And uh, there is this flow that people who work on crafts uh, talk of, and the people we work with talk about it all the time. They talk about how time disappears and time flies out the window, and also how they can think better because they're calmer, and how all the worry and the rage and the frustration of their situation um, disappears, and the, kind of, and the frustration of being in prison goes while they're working. So they want to work. And imagine having this feeling when you're locked in the cell, you feel part of a larger and more meaningful whole. That's the whole of, tra of exchange, of positive creative exchange where you're making something that someone else actually wants and likes and needs in their home. So there's another aspect to this, which is that craft products, as we know, are in demand, but they're too expensive to make in the Western industrialized world because they take so much time and they're not effective. But in prison, the fairly meager wage that the people we work with get for doing their craft work is actually um, then can, can be used um, to, to create great benefit. It's just some examples of some of the things that have made. Isn't it lovely? Chic and homely. And this, again, paradoxical because it's an ecclesiastical cope and is to do with sanctity and, and it's made in a prison and it was commissioned by a church. Um, these are in Dover Castle, and these embroidered peacocks were um, commissioned by English Heritage. And I heard that it actually took 400 hours to make that cushion. And the guy, um, at the end of the day, was counting the stitches, just for something to do. And this amazing quilt was made for Stella McCartney, and it's got tens of thousands of stitches in it. And it, I think um, the exquisite, fine, and detailed, miniaturist aspect of needlework um, is, is antithetical, isn't it, to everything that I was saying we, we know about prison. And of course, it provides an antidote and a chance for change. Um, there's a man, uh, this guy, started doing quilts in his cell, and then he progressed to upholstery on release. Getting out of prison was really frightening for him, as it is for very many people. He was institutionalized, he was paranoid, he had a label, and he thought he'd never get into work. But he did come out of prison with an object he'd been entrusted with. He had a quilt to finish. So the skills he learned as a quilter were easily translatable in the skills that he learned as an upholsterer when he got out, the planning, the attention to detail, the respect for handicraft and the skill with your hands. And there is a lot of work out there for leather workers, for upholsterers, for sewing machinists. And actually, I know a lot of employers who can't find enough people with these skills. Many would welcome ex-prisoners and not be prejudiced against them. Here's some more examples of the things achieved in prison. These needlepoint cushions are made by the Prince of Wales' interior designers, and um, we had, who was out there seeking commissions for people in prison because they know the quality of the work's good and they think it's a great cause. And this is some examples of things we've made. That ottoman was stitched in prison, and it's a lovely room, and honestly, half the things in it could have been made inside. The cushions, the furnishings, the lamps, all things actually we have made. We haven't made sofas yet. <laughs> but um, just an example of how much could be done. And this is an amazing piece. It's four by four meters. It was made by the great British artist Gavin Turk. It was all stitched inside. And um, it, it had 70 prisoners contributed to it. 
Gavin Turk is just one of many artists who are very, very keen to work with fine cell work. We have volunteers. We do not have enough capacity to work with the amount of creative, skilled, designer, and artist, and needlework, and craftspeople, volunteers who want to work with us. There's real huge capacity to revive arts that you may not even know about, crafts such as basket weaving and glove making and beading. All these things have value and purpose, and making them and, and learning them would reflect so well on ostracized people. This woman, was Sadie, was someone who was really transformed, I think, by her first commission. She always referred back to the feeling of being entrusted with something, which gave her a feeling of being needed, and that really was her moral turning point. She had a sense of reparation in being able to make and do something for someone else, and it restored a sense of her own personhood and her own value. And making products to order, in fact, is a much craved personalization for customers too. Don't we all want to have things in our home that have depth of meaning, that have a story behind them, that have a person behind them? So, we sell a lot of embroidered wedding quilts and christening quilts and cushions with names and dates on them, commemorative pieces that have been made in prison. And I, I know how much it means to the people who make these works that, as they say, they've been entrusted to make them. So finally, this is just a detail of a tablecloth that was commissioned uh, years ago and took a long time to complete because it was completed by an ex-offender who had moved back to Colombia. She was done for drug smuggling and her life had completely changed when she got back to Colombia. She really couldn't get back into work again and her family was broken. And the work that we were able to send her, which was for a commission for a castle in England, enabled her to save up enough money to move to Spain to where her brother was and make a new life for herself. So this object, this little detail from a beautiful tablecloth, is um, it, it's a picture of a meaningful, beautiful, cherished object. Not cheap, not throwaway, but a product that one knows has done somebody good. And likewise, for the maker, for the prisoner who made it, as one of our workers said, I feel like I'm putting something good out into the world. Thank you very much.